We were talking about what? The Great Pyramid. The Pyramid, yes. Pyramids of? Giza. Giza. Actually, we were talking about all pyramids, but we were focusing on those specifically. When were they built? Around 200 BC. About 2500 BCE, give or take, right? And did they originally just say, oh, we're just going to build giant pyramids? No, they started out with things called mastabas, right? And where were all the pyramids? East or the west of the Nile? West, why? Yeah, it symbolized. Death. death, right? Okay, good. All right, and we talked about how they uh, went from Mastabas to the Step Pyramid, was the first actual pyramid built. It was the Step Pyramid, then they went from the Step Pyramid to the Bent Pyramid. Flight engineering flaw, or architectural design flaw. And then they went to, this is still the Bent Pyramid, the Red Pyramid. Okay, and who is this for? Pharaoh. Nefru, yeah, good. Yeah, he was major on his products, uh, on his building projects. He was the first one to really start in or enter the whole pyramid building age. And then the pharaohs after him continued that for hundreds of years. But we specifically were interested in the pyramids of Giza. And remember we talked about this 1904 shot and how it's changed significantly since then. Um, some of it better, some of it worse. Um, one of the problems that they're having is, like I told you about all the pollution. Well, the pollution is very acidic, which means it's eating in the rocks. There's been more erosion in the last 100 years on the pyramids than there was in the previous 4,000 because of all the car pollution and all that stuff gets mixed in the air and it actually interacts with the rock and so it's not good on the pyramids at all. All right. And whose pyramid is the top one? And the middle one? And the bottom one? Okay, which one's the oldest? <laughs> top or bottom? Top one's the oldest, right? And then his son built this one. And then his son built this one. Notice they actually got smaller. They were kind of the idea, oh, every pharaoh is going to make a bigger and bigger one. That wasn't the case. In fact, we have some record, hieroglyphs, that shows that he didn't want to actually outdo his father. His father was a great um, pharaoh, and so he didn't want it to actually be bigger than that. But it's close. It's actually a little bit taller. I told you that. It's not as big, but it's on a little higher ground, so the tip of it actually was taller when it was there. Now notice the tips are all gone. The tips had this, were probably covered in gold tip, which went in a minute spectacular. The sides were all limestone white, so you would have these white, perfectly smooth pyramids with the gold tip on the top. All that's long been looted, stolen, destroyed. But all the stuff that they built it on is still there, which is what we see here. And it's still spectacular. If you ever get to Egypt, definitely go to the pyramids. It's very touristy. Don't ride the camels. Like, what? There's all these guys around there that say, hey, you want a camel ride? Camel ride, because that's how they make money. And then the, they say, okay. You say, all right, you know, 20 uh, Egyptian dollars or whatever it is. And then they get up there, and you, camels are really tall, and they won't let you down until you pay them more money. It's serious. It's really corrupt. <laughs> so it's kind of crazy. So it's not worth it anyway. I've ridden camels. They're no fun. I mean, you do it to say you rode a, cam rode a camel. You don't do it because it's enjoyable. Because even when they walk, it's really rough. It's not like riding a horse. Horses are much nicer. All right, sorry, off track again. But don't ride the camels. All right, and we started talking about the Pyramid of Khufu, which is a great pyramid. How many blocks? Yeah, about 2.2 million blocks. All right, this is where we stopped last time. What I wanted to explain was how did they line these up when we, when we talked about their 70, 760 some feet long on a side. How do you line that up to within a few arc minutes of being perfectly north, south, east, west? Only way you can do that is use the stars. Yeah. And you had to understand the stars and how they worked. 
So this is a star chart from 2550 BC. Actually, 2467 BC. Okay. Cool thing about our charts nowadays is you can run them as far back and forward as you want. After about a million years, they aren't accurate, but for our archaeology, they're plenty accurate. It's right on the money. Notice the center there. That's the North Celestial Pole. That's what everything spins around. The star close to it, the one you see here, is the star. I mentioned this the other day. Thuban, yeah, and the constellation of Draco the Dragon. Notice that it was not right on the North Celestial Pole. It was actually, it was about 1.7 degrees off. They knew that. So what they say was, okay, we want to figure out exactly north. We're going to use something called a plumb bob. Anybody know what a plumb bob is? If you do construction at all, you use the plumb bob. It's just a weight on a string. And lots of times if you're building a wall or something like that, you hang this at the top and then you make sure the bottom is right below it. It shows that your wall is perfectly vertical. It's used to make anything perfectly vertical. Gravity's always going to pull it down. So all it is is a weight, making sure the string comes out of the center of it. And that's all a plumb bob is. But they use these way back in Egyptian times, along with the compass and a straight edge. Okay. How do you use that to find north? Well, you hang this from some kind of stand that you made so that you get a line that you know is perfectly straight up and down. And then you would go out there, the pharaoh would go out there, and he would look along this, looking at the stars, until he saw these two stars right here. You see they draw a line between them. Okay, this is Mizar in the constellation of the Big Dipper right here. And this star is, let me look it up to make sure. Sometimes my memory is not as good as it should be. Mizar and Kutsha. So these were the two alignment stars. This one is in the Big Dipper, or technically, it's not the Big Dipper, it's Ursa Major. This is in the Little Dipper. Or technically Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. Okay. But you can see them here. Here's the Little Dipper. Here's the Big Dipper. North Celestial Pole is exactly on that line right between it, exactly at 2467 BC. But they didn't build this exactly at 2467 BC. It depends on which, which uh, pyramid you're looking at. And so they still use the same line, but it would be further off depending on when they built it. All right, the closest one was the Great Pyramid. It was closest to being built at this time. So that's the one that was the most accurate. All right, so you're like, what's this mean? What this means is, this is years, right? This should say BCE. This was an old thing, 20 years old or so. Notice that this is how far it is from being off from north, the pyramids, from being north in arc minutes. The closest one, which is number four right here, is the Pyramid of Khufu, the big one, all right? But notice these other ones almost all fall exactly on this line, except for number seven and five. But they actually fall on the line too. If you look at it, you see this line? This is the mirror image of this line. So what happened was, when the pharaohs were lining up these stars, for one, pyramids one, two, three, four, six, and eight, they all had it lined up so that Kochab was on the top, Mizar was on the bottom. And then the errors would all be just dependent upon procession making them shift. When they did these two pyramids, they had it flipped over. Which works, but it shifts your error to the other side. So if you do that, these actually would fall on the line, meaning if I mirrored this up here, 
they would fall on the line. That's why we have a pretty good idea, or we're pretty sure that this is exactly how they lined it up, because they all hit on that line. They all use the same stars, and how far they are off was just seeing precession slowly change the north celestial pole. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the inside chambers here. This is again the Great Pyramid of Khufu. Critical here. There's only one entrance, and the entrance is on the north side. Why the north side? In fact, all the pyramids only had an entrance on the north side. That was it. Okay. Remember, to the north was where the circumpolar stars were, where the north celestial pole was, the stars that didn't set. Those were the special ones. Those were the imperishable stars. And so to the north was the most important way. So the, every entrance was only to the north. Now, they had the, if you go in, you have this descending chamber, which goes down below ground. And they were digging this out. It was only half dug out. We think this was originally where they were going to put the tomb, because all the pharaohs were, were buried below ground normally. The older pyramids, they were still buried below ground, even with the pyramid above it. But somehow, somewhere in their construction, remember the construction went on for a good 20 years or so, they changed their mind. And they built another passage coming up here. And then off of this passage, you go to what they call the Queen's Chamber. And then they have what they call the Grand Gallery. Because down here, the tunnel is actually very narrow. It's about this tall. So if you're going through it, you got to crouch down and go like this. It wouldn't have been very comfortable at all. I mean, it was easier for them, they're like slightly shorter, but they still would have been crawling through it. But when you're chiseling through the rock, you don't make the tunnel any bigger than you have because it's hard work. Okay, but this, the Grand Gallery, and all this in here was designed into it, meaning they were building, as they were building the pyramid, they built these rooms. Down here, no, this was being chiseled out afterwards. The entrance was built into it too. So they had this start going in. So they're building some things as they're going and they were adding things as they went okay here they realized this is the king's chamber i'm going to show you pictures of the inside shortly here but in the king's chamber right here they realized if you have a big hole in the center and then you put millions of tons of block over it, it's going to just collapse so what you have to do is you have to put load bearing stones above that bigger rocks that can take the weight of all the rocks on top of it and then they realized that they had four of those and they said and what also helps is if you put them in an angle because it actually shifts the force from above outward instead of straight down. So these were these were good engineers, is what I'm saying. They knew what they were doing. There's actually rooms in here because you know it was all rocks. And so in some spots, the rocks weren't close enough together, you can crawl through in different places inside the pyramids if you're not claustrophobic. Because it's kind of crazy. But all right. Also, from here, in fact, it doesn't show it here. We're going to talk about it in a second. From the king's chamber and the queen's chamber, there's two shafts coming out. One each to the north and one to the south. Okay? We call them air shafts, but we don't think they were actually ever for air. They're not to climb in because they're only about this big, so there's no way you could climb through them. Okay? But they were put in there at a very precise angles from those two chambers. All right, here's a picture of the entrance on the outside. The entrance is actually here. You see the rocks that they built into it. This is actually another way in. They tunneled in and meets up with the tunnel coming from this way. So if you go in now, you actually go in below. You don't come in the top part. They don't let tourists much into the Khufu pyramid. They do let you into the, uh, yeah, I think it's the Menkari one. One of the other ones you can go in if you want. Uh, but they don't let tourists in here. There were too much, uh, too much problem with people coming in. You get too many people coming in, it starts to uh, cause problems. All right, so this is what the inside of it looks like. This is the Grand Gallery. So you have this tunnel that's as big, and it all opens up to this huge hallway. Obviously, the pipes and stairs are added later for tourists. But this is the way it looked, and the lighting in here was all added too. All their lighting would have been done by oil lamps. That's pretty much what they used back then. Okay. 
This is from the King's Chamber. This is one of these air shafts, which again, we don't think was an air shaft. I'll show you, I think I got another picture of that. Here is the interior of the King's Chamber. Now we think when the Pharaoh was buried there, it was spectacular. I mean, all the walls were painted with all kinds of hieroglyphs. It was covered in gold. There would have been all kinds of, there would have been a sarcophagus within a sarcophagus and all kinds of all of his wealth would have been in there. All that's been looted. It was probably looted within 20 years of him being buried. We don't know, but none of it's there anymore. So all we see is the structure of the room. All right, so about 20 years ago, they said, hey, we want to see what's up these chambers because you can't see. So they made a little car with a, with a camera on it and they drove up there or drove up as far as they could and they ran into a limestone block right here with two pieces of metal copper sticking out of it. Yeah, why? We don't know. Does it go on beyond that? We don't know. All kinds of questions. It doesn't ever come out to the outside. So you can't like come in from the outside. We're not sure exactly where it would come out. So that's why we, they're not air shafts or maybe they were air shafts where they're building. I don't know. Nobody really knows actually. All right, but this is what I want you to talk about. You see there's an air shaft here, 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 and here. These two come from the King's Chamber, which is right down here. These two go to the Queen's Chamber which is below it, but a little bit off shift. They didn't worry about it being exactly in the center. If you notice, these are not exactly in the center. Okay. But when you're digging in 300 feet, it's really hard to tell where the center is, okay? So they didn't worry about that. All right, but these are critical because they point to very specific directions or very specific stars. This was done deliberately. The angle of each of them is very specific. And you got to remember that we do our herb diagram for Egypt. We have north here, south here. Where's the north celestial of pole going to be? Well, it's at the latitude of the pyramids. What's the latitude of the pyramids? 30 degrees north. So they're close to the same latitude that we're at. We're at 33. All right, and then the celestial equator was here. Okay. What angle is that? 32 degrees, right? So the North Celestial Pole is at 30 degrees. How far is Thuban off from the North Celestial Pole at the time it was built? Yeah, about two degrees. That shaft right there was deliberately pointed towards the star Thuban. Yeah. This one from the Queen's Chamber points to the star Kochab. What's Kochab? Yeah, one of the ones they used to align it, right? It's from the Little Dipper. So it was a very special star in itself. These on this side, this one up here, goes to Orion's belt. Now, to the Egyptians, it wasn't Orion. That's Greek. To the Egyptians, this was Osiris. So their constellation was Osiris, the god of the afterlife. And this pointed right towards Orion's belt, at 2500 BC. It doesn't point there now because the procession had shifted. So is this Osiris then or is it Osiris? It's Osiris. They actually had a slightly different shape than what we consider Orion. But yes, it went towards those three stars. So those three stars weren't Osiris's belt. If you want to be technical. For this class, don't worry about it, all right? It's towards Osiris. <laughs> and then the one below it, points towards the, the most important star in the sky to the Egyptians. Anybody know what it is? The sun? No, nope, other than the sun. The sun was important, Ra. Mm -hmm. It was the brightest star in the sky. Sirius. Sirius. Anybody hear Sir, Sirius? Sirius is the brightest star in the sky. It's also called the dog star because it's part of the Canis Major's big dog. 
right? This points right to it. To them, it wasn't Sirius. Sirius was actually an Arabic name. To them, this was Isis. Who's Isis? Okay, and? A queen, yeah. You remember, oh, we're going to get to more gods later. I'll talk about more about the, what the guys were. But Isis was one of the main four gods, right? Okay. Um, along with the Cyrus, Seth, and Isis. Okay, we'll get to more of those later. Don't worry about it now. But this was the brightest star in the sky. Why was this important to the Egyptians? Because Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, or Isis to them, when it would what we call have a helical rising, it rises just before the sun does. So if you're watching the east, you'll see it just before it rises, just before the sun does. That only happens on a certain day of the year. That signaled the Nile was about to flood. So to them, they would watch that. Watch for that star. And then there's another bright star real close to it just to, that would rise just a few minutes before Sirius. It was called Procyon or the preceding star. So you saw that star that would precede the one star. The one star was the Sirius star when it came up and it was rising just before the sun. It meant the Nile was about to flood, so they were using it as a calendar. So that was a very important star to them. All right. So could you draw this and show what each of these go to? On a test. You have to make it as detailed as the... No. But I have to be able to tell what you're talking about, right? So you have to have the right ones going to the right place. From the king's chamber, it points to Thuban and Osiris, or Orion's belt. From the queen's chamber, it points towards Kochab and Isis. Or Sirius. Okay. There's no tunnels going east or west. Everything you notice is on a north-south line here. We have our own uh, printer that does 3D printing here. And it was kind of cool. I found this model online. It's the Great Pyramid. But when you open it up, it actually has all the chambers in it. Kind of cool, huh? I'm like, oh, hey, that's a cool thing to print. You know, when you get a printer, you just start printing everything until mm -hmm. you run out of plastic. But yeah, that's what I did. That's what I brought. All right. Other pyramids have chambers and stuff, but they don't seem to have these air shaft alignments that Khufu does. This is very special. This is when they were really showing off their astronomical knowledge, it seems. Yeah. Um, yeah. Notice also, this is kind of interesting too, that we see it now, it actually only goes to here, but originally it went up to a perfect point, so the height is slightly different than it is what we measure now, is not what the original height was. It's missing rocks off the top. And the size of it is slightly different too, because you had this limestone outer part. Well, that's gone. So it's actually a few feet bigger originally than it was now. All right. How much? All right, we're out of time. We're going to go outside and see if we can find north. Now, how we're doing that is, uh, remember we talked about this, that one way to find north is you take the shadow from a stick in the morning, and then you go away in the afternoon, and when the shadow is exactly the same length, you draw those lines, and then you bisect the angle. And that should give you a north-south line if the shadows are exactly the same length. So this morning I was out there with a little help, and we drew all these lines out there. And so we're going to go out there now, and we're going to wait until the shadow is the same length. When it's the same length, you're going to draw that line. The other one's already drawn. You're going to bisect that angle. Now you have to do some tricky things because we don't have a compass big. All right, <laughs> a little compass. So you're going to have a meter stick. But you can use this as a compass. What you do is you just hold one end of it, and then you mark it, you put the chalk, I'm gonna give you a piece of chalk, you mark it on this side, and then you mark it over here, it acts like a compass because it keeps it exactly one meter. And then you're gonna do the same thing and move up to those points, but you're gonna keep it and just do it, and I always essentially use this as a compass one meter long, you just fix one end of it. Does that make sense? All right, I have 11 setups. I think we have, 
you have 19 people, so about two to a group. You can pick who you want to work with. If you don't, then who's ever left, we're just going to pair you up. Just randomly, okay? That's the way, way it is. And uh, it's a little cool out there. Make sure you bring your coats and stuff. And yeah, I wouldn't leave anything in here because it's not going to be locked. So if you're worried about it, don't bring it with you, okay? And we'll go out there and get... 